level of those who are recipients of God's grace. And so in response to his grace, we say, Lord, here am I. How can you use me? Lord, here am I. Lord, you use me in some way to serve and to bless. And so that's why in our ministry fair and our time today, we want to be thinking about God, you have made me by your grace. Now you've made me as your workmanship. Remember last week we had Lisa with with the potter's wheel and the clay. Now, Lord, you've made me to use me in some way. So we're asking God constantly, Lord, open my eyes to see Jesus at work around me. And then you show me what I can do to be a part of it. So in Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to be continuing at verse 11. Ephesians chapter 2, turn with me in your Bibles in verse 11. And here we want to take a look at how the Lord Jesus breaks down the barriers that stop us from serving. Because whenever it comes to saying, okay, how can I, what can I do to help? There's all these reasons and we have barriers. Even even with with some of the booths, when you go there, you'll find barriers in yourself that say, "Uh uh-uh, I'm not even going to go look. There's barriers between us and God, and then these barriers that build up between ourselves. But Jesus, in his grace, asked us to remember what it was like before we knew Christ, but also lets us look forward to what life can be under his peace and under his rule. Ephesians chapter 3, chapter 2, excuse me, verse 11. Therefore, remember... Can we say remember? Come on, let's try it again. Remember. Okay. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, that done in the body by the hands of men, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise. You are without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace. And in this one body, to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. The Holy Spirit building us up as a church, as a people. And here it begins, we're going to look at our key verse, verse 13, of what happens when the Lord Jesus breaks into our lives. We've just finished... um, Yesterday, grieving and remembering and honoring those with 9-11. And in 9-11, they have a motto. And the motto is, never forget. And here Paul tells us to remember, not to forget what it was like when we were far away from God. Now, if you don't know the Lord and that's where you are today, I pray that today you'll, you'll take a step and get close to him. 
But he wants us to remember what is in the past in order that the things of the past may now become present with us today. So we'll look at this again. But let's read our verse. In, we have Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13. But now, in Christ Jesus. If you can go to verse 13. Okay? And let's read it with me. But now, in Christ Jesus. Read it with me. But now. When Jesus interrupts, when Jesus comes into our life. Okay? Everything changes. Whatever was in the past. When the Lord comes in, in the same way he talked last week about being dead in trespasses and sins. But then God shows up and he shows up in his great love and he saves us. So in the same way, these dividers, these barriers that are in our life, that were in our life in the past, keeping us from God and keeping us from each other. Now Jesus intercedes. So let's read it again. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. What was far away? You were far from God, brought near through the blood of Christ. Far from people, in relationships, in family, in marriages, in different ethnic groups, in different nations, brought near through the blood of Christ. And it begins when we remember what it was like when we were far away, when we were separated. There's two key groups in this passage. The one are those who are God's chosen people. They are the circumcised. They are the Jews. They hold the promises. They hold the law. They hold the word of God to be a blessing to the nations. And he's referring to Gentiles. That's all the rest of us who are not Jews. And how they were excluded from being a Jew and being the heart of God. What it was like when you were excluded from being God's people. You're just in the wrong group. You live in the wrong place. You have the wrong color skin. You didn't grad from the right school. Um, it's a family you're from, may not be the right family. Your accent, how you talk, all of those things exclude you from being on the inside. And Jesus has come and he wants each of us to remember um, I, I was heard a story of one of the, um, the firemen of 9-11. And this fireman, he was off. He had finished his, his duty and he went home. And it was his time to, to rest and replenish after being uh, busy at work. But his wife called him to the television set and showed him as the, the tower was collapsing, the first tower was collapsing. And of course, his heart melted. Now, he could have responded and saying, hey, it's my day off. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. There's lots of other firemen out to respond. And he could have excluded himself from the need. And that's, that's human nature for all of us. We have massive needs around us in this community, in our islands. Massive needs in the other nations that we touch through missions. And yet so often we, we exclude ourselves from being involved. And the fireman, you can imagine, he didn't stay put. It was his day off. Let someone else do it. He went back to the station. He took a bus with the other fireman and went right into the center of the heart. Just as, as the other tower was collapsing, there were, there were, you couldn't see, they said, more than 10 yards because the smoke was so thick. But he put himself forward. And when we remember... It is so the values of the past, the selflessness of what we saw in 9-11 is to now be also the value that we hold today. And so when Paul says, remember what it was like to be outside of the group. Remember what it was like when you showed up to church and no one said hi to you. Remember what it was like when you didn't have an Ohana group. Remember what it was like when you didn't know anybody and, you, and, and all of those things of being on the outside. And he does that so that we bring the value of love and of grace that is from Jesus into today and whatever we have. And that's what Jesus is wanting for each one of us, to bring that value of selfless love and grace into our lives. 
So we have, remember when you were separated from Christ in verse 12, 11 and 12. You're excluded from God's people. You are apart from Christ and without hope. To be apart from Christ is to be without hope. And we are looking in our world for hope in all kinds of different ways, all kinds of situations. But if Christ is not there, you are apart from hope. But if Christ is there, you have all the hope of eternity in all the hope of our Heavenly Father and of the Holy Spirit poured out and available to us because He gives us citizenship. He gives us citizenship in God's eternal kingdom. But then there's a third thing He reminds us. He says, remember when you were separate, you were foreigners to God's covenant of promise. You're going to see two covenants today. Well, you're going to see three covenants. You're going to see the Old Testament covenant, which is that given to Moses, and it was rooted in the law and the character and the word of God. And God's chosen people were to keep that law and to reflect God's character to themselves, to the Lord, and to the nations. And, and this was, they were estranged from that. They were foreigners. And some of you have been raised in families that you didn't have a family that, that followed Christ. You didn't have a family that modeled what it was to be a church. And so it, it's, it's foreign. How do I be a Christian husband? How do I be a Christian wife? What does it mean to, to pray for each other? What does it mean to have devotions? And so there is this foreign component. But Jesus brings us. He wants us to remember that old feeling so that we, we value his grace as he brings us close into the covenant of promise that we'll talk about in a few minutes. To be a foreigner is a really tough stuff. We've been praying for the Hansons as they go back to Japan um, because even though they've been studying language, it's going to be obvious that they're new at studying language, at, at speaking Japanese. And they're probably going to get teased. They'll be loved too. But there'll be components in which in which little children will laugh because they get a word wrong or they say it backwards or they do whatever they shouldn't. And when you're a foreigner, you get all these things. Sometimes you're actually judged. And, um, and it's, it's, it's a very awkward feeling. And Paul says, I want you to remember what that's like so that you appreciate the kindness and the love of God that he's brought you in. Let me just give you some advice. This is just an aside. Um, if you want to be wise, never criticize today's grandparents' day. Never criticize someone's grandparents. It's just not wise. You know, your grandmother wore army boots. No, don't go there, okay? That, that's not a wise thing to do. And if you're smart, you will never criticize someone's mother. Not a wise thing. doesn't matter if they were good mothers or bad mothers. If you're wise, you will never criticize someone's wife. Not a good move. To do. And if you are wise, you will never criticize someone's children. It's not because they're perfect. It's because that's not your place. But if you're wise, you will also never criticize someone else's country. They may laugh and smile with you. Not a wise thing to do. You see, he wants you to remember what it was like when you were the one who are getting teased. When you were the one your first day and you didn't have any friends at school and you didn't know anyone. And that feeling is there. So there is a compassion of grace like the same great love of God in you for wherever God takes you and whatever your situation is. So remember what it was like. And so it, it pulls back the judgment that we have of the flesh that comes in ourselves. And we enter into God's life and God's blessing. Okay. In this, if we are to be one together in peace, it comes in our relationship with Jesus. And it comes as he comes and enters in powerfully in our lives. So in verse 13, it says, but now in Christ. This is what life is, is apart from Christ. But when Christ comes in, everything changes. So, but now... There is a new community in Christ. But now in Christ Jesus, verse 13, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. What was far is brought near through Jesus Christ, 
through his cross. So, husbands and wives, you can feel really far at times from your spouse. How is it that you bring, you come near in Christ? Well, you don't feel like approaching your wife or your wives. You may not feel like approaching your husband. But when Jesus comes in and he's at the center, you approach Christ. And Christ approaches your spouse. And so what was far between the two of you now is brought near in Christ. And that's why when you learn to pray together, there is a coming near. Children, if, if you are far from your parents and they don't understand you and you don't get it, what, what Jesus does is he brings you near when he's at the center. Because Jesus understands how you're thinking and Jesus understands the issues and Jesus brings you near. This is the truth and the power of the gospel of God. And he makes a new community in Christ. A church are people who are in Christ, with Christ at the center. And a church is a community. It's a family in him. There are all kinds of differences between us. All kinds of differences with, with people that we partner with in the gospel around the world in, and here. But there's only one thing we have in common. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Only thing you need in common. And so we have, we have Pastor Elwell here. And, and I mean, you go to a, a, a Koshayan service, it's totally different. You go to the service after this and, and the Tongan service, it'll be totally different from what, what you think. You, if, if you were here yesterday for work day, we had all 10 different churches and they were serving and working and helping in different ways and we were working, all very different. Some of us can't even understand each other in language. We look different. We feel different. But we have one thing in common. And what's the one thing in common? We are in Christ, the Lord Jesus. And he is our Savior and he is our Lord. And that's true in terms of the Christians in Japan are totally different from the Christians in, in, in China and the Christians in Afghanistan. By the way, any of you watch news? Any of you watch news? Yeah, a few of you? Okay. Well, I, I want to encourage you, if you watch news, would you please watch some Christian news? <laughs> there is so much Christian news. And I was watching a um, Christian news network, and they were reporting on this week in China that, that there was the, a, a school. It's a Christian music school. It's a music high school. And it was rated, and it's in um, the Maisie Christian uh, Music High School, and it was rated by 30 policemen and and the Chinese Communist Reps and the, uh, the Religion Bureau. And they came and they, they took all the teachers away, they took the principal away, they took all the computers, they took all the books, took all the children away, this high school. The next day they returned all the teachers and the children, they didn't return any of the equipment or anything else, but the principal is gone. And so they're asking us to pray for the, the principal and his family. You know, a, a, a church is a community of people in Christ. But we are set apart from those in the world. And our peace is found in him, not in the outward situation. It says, but now, in Christ, you who were once far away, we've been brought near through his blood. And so we pray for churches around the world. Why? Because we're joined to them. We may be very far from China, but we're joined to them. We're brought near in his blood. But we are brought near by the blood of the new covenant. In this new covenant, remember I said you see three covenants. There's the old covenant. This is the new covenant in Christ. And when we take communion, Christ commanded us to remember what he has done for us and his broken body on the cross and his shed blood for us. We're brought near by the blood of the covenant. Um, the third covenant that I'm going to refer to is our church's covenant. And this is a reflection. And our, our church is a covenant. And the first line of our covenant is we, the body of Christ, united in striving to know him and to do his will. We are the body of Christ. What does it mean to be a part of this church? You just, do you know Jesus? Are you in Christ? And are you committed 
to striving to know him better. Why? Because if you want to know him better, then we're all going to be more like him. And then to do what he has called us to do. Remember the two questions we said, Lord, open my eyes to see what you are doing and how you are active. We want to know Christ more. And then secondly, Lord, how can I do, how can I serve you in some way? And there bring honor to your name. So we are brought near by the blood of the new covenant. Now, whatever distance there is, whether that's between people or relationships or families, the blood of Jesus brings us closer. Can we say closer? And closer. And closer. So if you want that which is separated to draw closer, you start with the blood of Jesus. You put Jesus, but now you put him at the center of your relationship. You put him at the center of your work. You put him at the center of your problem. You put him at the center of your prayer life. And then it comes closer and closer. Now you can go to psychiatrists. You can go to psychologists. You can read all kinds of books to help you. But what will bring that which is separated closer is the blood of Jesus. And we need to learn to pray the blood of Jesus and to apply the blood of Jesus in our lives. And his blood speaks eternally and can do what no one else and nothing else can do. Now, I'm going to need uh, your help and Nathan, maybe your help too. And just Christ's blood not only brings close what is far away, but it abolishes the dividing walls. Come on. Okay, thanks, Jordan. Okay, it abolishes... Here, Nathan, you can take this one. And I was going to do this at the beginning of the service, but I knew people would freak. Um, so I didn't. So I was going to line dividers the whole way down. And you wouldn't be able to see the screen, and you'd complain, and you'd say all this stuff. And because division is very real. Okay? And when there's dividers, it's not comfortable. And the divisions that are around us are, are very, very real. And you can feel them. It's icy cold. You're on one side, you're on the other. I was asked to do a, a Samoan funeral. And I said, what? No way. Have you ever been to a Samoan funeral? It is totally different. I mean, they, just, they, they prep for a day and they, they visit all day and they sing and they do everything. And, and, and I said, bottom line, I'm not Samoan. I can't even pretend to be Samoan. I mean, I, I can do my very best, but I'm just not going to cut it. I'm just some howly guy. I said, go to any of our Simone pastors. We got all these Simone pastors. That's fine. They'll gladly. They said, uh, no, we tried. You see, the problem, I always thought that, you know, the Simones don't get along with the Tongans and they don't get along with the Goshians, don't get along with the Chiquis, don't get along with the Japanese, don't get along with the Filipinos, don't get along with the whites, don't get along, you know, you know, the divisions, how it works in Hawaii. Okay. That's how I always thought. I never figured that there were groups of Simones that didn't get along with groups of Simones. I guess it makes total sense because there's lots of groups of whites that don't get along with groups of whites and lots of groups of, uh, okay, and that, that's just how it was. And, and they said, no, we need someone neutral because we got, we got people from Camp 4 Housing and we got people from KPT and we got people from Mayor Wright and we got people, and they don't get along. We need someone neutral. The dividing walls are huge in our culture and the dividing walls are increasing Critical race theory, which is now being promoted through all of our schools. Critical race theory, why is it called critical? Because critical starts with, it is Marxist philosophy. That's why it's critical. It's Marxist the, uh, the, uh, philosophy, and it is being promoted and to try to deal with all the barriers of race in our society that they say are systemic. And so the only way is to wipe out the system and it's totally transform. Okay, now Jesus, in contrast to that, says no. He comes and he breaks down the barriers. Whatever these barriers are, he comes and he comes with his cross and with his blood. And if I was to do this right, I would take a sledgehammer and I would start smashing this barrier down. He doesn't just move it. He demolishes it because this is a barrier of hostility. It's a barrier of hate. It's a barrier that happens when people are different from you and you don't understand them. John, can you just collapse that in? And they don't understand you. 
And Jesus has destroyed those barriers. When you come across a barrier on any level, it can be a macro level, it can be a small level, you bring the blood of Jesus and you bring the cross of Jesus because what he has done is broken down every barrier that exists in Christ Jesus. Amen? So now you can go anywhere. You can be anyone. It doesn't matter what ethnicity you are. It doesn't matter what system you are in because Jesus Christ has broken down the barrier. That is why every communist country hates the church. That is why every totalitarian system tries to destroy the word of God. Because Jesus breaks down barriers, but some want to maintain control by building barriers. And so in Christ, we are united in peace and we remain in that as we allow Christ to abolish in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. When they nailed him to the cross in his flesh. He was breaking down the hostilities in your family, in mine, between our communities, between our countries, whatever disparities. That is why Christ died, and we claim that. Now, there's, um, I was just reading in terms of Afghanistan, and as we struggle and cry, um, in Afghanistan, the Taliban have reinstated the ministry of virtue and vice. Now, that sounds really good, like a lot of bad things sounds good. A ministry of virtue. But the virtue that they are promoting is the virtue of Islamic Sharia law, which says that a woman is not allowed to walk outside alone unless she has her husband. So if you're not married, you can't go out at all. And, and this um, ministry... Government ministry is the most feared and hated department of the Taliban uh, regime uh, before uh, we went in. Uh, because they are the ones who regularly beat and stone and, and hang women in public in order to kill vice and in order to maintain the virtue. And so one of these Christian women who was hiding with other women who were not married and terrified, not knowing what, what to do, she asked Christians in America to pray. But listen to what she asked to pray. In her prayer, she did not ask for her protection. She didn't ask that we would send in helicopters to rescue her out. She didn't ask in terms of anything about herself. What she asked was she said, pray for the Taliban. Pray for the Lord to touch their hearts. Pray to know them to know the real kingdom of God and pray that the Taliban would know the king of the world is Jesus. I don't have a lot of faith to pray those kinds of things. Because that barrier is so big, it reaches up to heaven. But Jesus can demolish even that barrier. And it will be demolished when people get on their knees and they pray. In the name and by the power of the blood of our Savior. And they're demolishing it now. As Christians in Afghanistan pray in Afghanistan, people around the world pray because Jesus is the one who breaks down the barriers. We remain united in peace in Christ when we are, realize we are made as one body and we are reconciled through the cross. It's the cross that brings all the different pieces and people together. No cross, no unity. No Jesus, no peace. No blood, there's no bringing near or coming near. But with the cross, there is a reconciling and a coming together of these very, very different people. We all have a different shape. Churches have different shapes. Individuals have different shapes. Nations have different shapes. We have different giftings. We have different experience. We have different background. But the Lord brings it all together into one, and he reconciles us. Chinese and Japanese, English and French and Korean and American and black and white and anything you want to add in there. One in Christ. A million, million differences. One similarity. But that one is Jesus. And if you didn't notice in the passage, it talks about the two becoming one. Okay, the two 
becoming one. Does it remind you of anything? Okay, those of you that are longing to have a partner someday, those of you that are married, it, it, it should stir some romance in you. This is all the two becoming joined and one. And what is true on a macro scale in terms of the church and of Jesus working in the world is true on the smallest scale of your marriage, of any relationship. God can bring it together when he enters in and make it one. That is why there's hope in Christ when Jesus is there for any relationship as he's working. Okay, let's finish this off. So we, we remember, we look back, what, what was it like so that we have this grace and this heart of compassion when I was excluded from God, when I was apart from, from Christ and in, in his hope. And, and we remember when I was outside of God's covenant of promise. We, we live now, and how do we keep this bond of peace? We keep it in the context of a community that is new in Christ. We learn to apply the blood of Christ in, in his new covenant in terms of bringing that which is separated close and near, in terms of the power of forgiveness, of canceling shame and sin. We abolish dividing walls. And when we see them being raised up, we abolish them through the cross. And we abolish hostility. It's been said that, that for Satan to win, for evil to triumph, in a permanent mode, two things have to happen. One is that evil has to be done. Okay, and we've talked about some of the horrendous kinds of evil that, that we see. Evil will take place. But for it to have lasting impact, a second kind of evil has to happen. And this is what Satan is trying to bait in each of us. And that is that there is evil that is retaliated in response. But Jesus, he enters in and he stops the lasting impact of evil in his people who come and bring love and grace instead of retaliation. And that's, that's through the cross. You see, all the evil was placed on the cross on Christ. So we do not have to retaliate. We will leave the wrath of God to him. Our job is to act as one body and to be reconciled together in the cross. So we renew the peace of Christ. There is this ongoing new pouring out of peace in places that are lacking peace, in places that are needing the grace of God. You see in verse 17, that, uh, in verse 15, excuse me, that Jesus made one new man in himself, out of the two, making peace. And in this one body, he reconciled both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. Verse 17, he came and he preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. There is this preaching of peace now. We've received the peace of Christ and by his grace. He's broken down the dividing walls. We've applied the blood of Christ. And now to continue that peace, we allow that peace to flow through us and to preach to others. Jesus is himself. You remove Jesus out of this, you get no peace. You can try to make peace all you want. You can create ways and dialogue and communication. But if you remove Jesus out of there, because peace, you will not find peace. Peace is rooted in himself and in his presence. So, first of all, we are fellow citizens with God's people. If we want to keep this peace in our lives, it comes as we are together valuing each other as equal citizens together in God's church. And so this is, is the covenant that we make together as God's people. And in two weeks, we're going to be renewing and affirming our church. We're 100, 108 years old next week and, uh, in our church. And we've, we have this covenant of striving to know Christ better, being united in his body and seeking to do his will. And we work together, we pray together. Together is the key dynamic. 
and that membership of being together is more and more important as the divisions and the hostility increase. God's people need each other. That's why we are constantly encouraging you, get into an Ahana group, get tied into some ministry so that you are together and rooted with God's people. To renew the peace of Christ, secondly, you want to be members. It says we are members of God's household. I'll read this part, verse 19. Consequently, you're no longer foreigners or aliens. Praise God. We are fellow citizens with God's people. And then we are members of God's household. So when there's a problem in a household, it's everyone's problem. You got a pile full of dirty dishes in the, in the kitchen, right? That's your problem. You don't say, oh, that's someone else in the house. It's, it's a household problem. Today we had Eddie this morning and, and he came with Sepe and we, we prayed and sent them off as they're going to, to Florida to try to get a new liver and, and, and to pray for that process. Well, if he's got a problem, that's our problem. That's our prayer. When we send off a missionary family, uh, they, they, their needs become our needs. We pray together. We're a household. We are our family. And whatever needs there are, we try to care for each other. So we, our shape is there for us to serve and to love, to have an all-important part. And then it says we are built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets in verse 20. This household is built on the word of God, on the eyewitness testimony of, of those who were there with Jesus and saw the resurrection. They are built upon the prophets and the history that we have all through scripture. And that that is the true foundation that we have. Truth is so necessary. And without it, there is no foundation for us to be able to live the Bible. And then it says, we are joined to Jesus, who is our chief cornerstone. It says, we are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ himself as the chief cornerstone. Those of you that understand, this relationship with Jesus is on which everything else is built. In a church, what matters is your relationship with Jesus. <laughs> your relationship with Jesus goes down, it affects everything else. Your relationship with Jesus goes up, it affects everything else. It's the same for your marriage, by the way. Your relationship with Jesus goes up, it blesses the whole family and the whole household. Your relationship with Jesus goes down, it hurts the whole thing. That's why we're constantly talking about in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. And you can do all kinds of other things, but the foundation, the stone, the, head, the cornerstone is the one that aligns everything, keeps it level, keeps it straight, and holds everything. You can have little stuff unaligned and, and in different places, but if that key relationship with the cornerstone gets out of line, the whole thing crumbles. And so as a church, we are constantly seeking Jesus, we are constantly seeking to know him and to grow in him. And the last thing in Ephesians uh, chapter 2 is that we are built together as a temple for the Spirit. Now, it's being built. You know, the, this church has, has seen amazing things throughout the years. But all that's in the past. The Holy Spirit is building us now for what is needed now. And we are being built. We are being built together as a church to be a temple of the Holy Spirit. And this is the activity. And you're a part of it. You weren't a part of 70 years ago. But you're a part of it now. And I wasn't a part of it. But I'm a part of it now. And each one of us with our shape, with our abilities at this moment... The crisis that we face now is the same as the crisis of 9-11. It's not the same in its locality and, and, and in its description, but the crisis of people's lives and what is needed to go out there and to serve selflessly and to share the gospel and to be there for people. It is now. And yet who are going to be the ones who say, hey, it may be my day off, but I'm still going to go and I'm still going to serve. Because the Lord Jesus calls us into the community and the needs we have, it is overwhelming and we have half the people. And, and it, you know, for, for those, praise God, if you are, are at home or you're quarantining or whatever, that is so hard. Join us in the battle of praying. 
Join us in the work of study of Scripture. Draw yourself closer to Christ, because if you're closer to Christ, then the whole church will be blessed and affected. But if you're slipping away, everyone else is weakened and affected, and the fruit doesn't happen. And so there is this call for us to be built together, not individually, but together he builds us. And whatever barriers stop you from working together with God's people, you smash them down. And they may be built up by politics, they may be built up by disease, they may be built up by race, they may be built up with all kinds of things, but the blood of Jesus smashes them down until we are together and we serve in the name of Jesus. It's real stuff. It's real stuff. But we have an amazing, an amazing Savior who sits on the throne and is building his church to fill us up with his spirit. Ready to stand? Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, we we just thank you. Thank you for the work of Christ. Lord, we're saved by grace through faith. It's not our own doing. None of us can boast. None of us. It's all of you by your great love. But you've made us. We are your workmanship. You are making us continually, Lord, to do good works. Lord, that you may be glorified, that people would be loved, that people would be saved. Lord, that there would be your grace poured into so many difficult situations. Lord, in our homes right here. Lord, in our communities right here. Lord, those that are watching. Father, those that don't know Christ. Those that are in other countries. Lord, those on the mission field. Father, that the presence and the power of Jesus would go forward. And yet you've called us, Lord, to serve. So, Lord, whatever our situation... Whatever our limitations, Lord, that you would break down the barriers through the blood of Christ. Lord, that we would be tied in together with your people. And Lord, in the work of building the kingdom of God. Lord, thank you that each one here, Lord, have your hand on their shoulder. And saying, hey, open, look at this. This is where I'm working. I want you to be part of it. And Lord, stir us to pray, stir us to work, stir us to serve. We thank you, Lord, and we bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to know you face to face. Kneel at the throne of grace, for grace is making my heart brand new. Fill me with love and truth. I finally see you face to face